she stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, please. Please note for the record that all council members are present. All right. Duly noted. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. Okay. I have a motion. Two seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those? Okay. Got an operating menu. <coughs> okay. City manager, budget overview. Is this on? Okay. Um, good morning and uh, welcome to our... Uh, Warriors Championship next day party. Yeah. <laughs> well, we really know, we how, really to know how to throw them, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to be very brief uh, this morning. Um, Stuart's going to get into a lot more detail with you on a number of items. Um, this is our second consecutive two-year budget. Um, it's also a priority-based budget. Um, we've formatted it a little bit different uh, this time around. Um, this is kind of an, an evolving process for us in terms of the uh, uh, trying to make this more of a policy document and less of a numbers document. Um, budgets will always have numbers, but it's really more about the policy in terms of services the city is going to pro provide um, and also our long-term fiscal planning. Excuse me. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, in detail. Um, but over the last several years, uh, as the council knows, we've done a number of things in terms of our long-term issues. Um, putting monies away for our uh, equipment and our for our buildings, um, also starting to put money away for some of the long-term liability issues like uh, pensions and health care uh, for retirees. Um, there are challenges for certain um, as we move uh, forward, um, but we believe that this year's uh, two-year or this two-year budget um, is a reflection of um, a stable uh, financial uh, situation at the moment. Um, one that requires a kind of uh, constant uh, oversight and uh, attention, uh, which we give it, uh, which you give it, and uh, we will continue to do that, obviously, as we move, uh, move forward. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Stuart. Um, he's going to dive into some details and numbers uh, today with you. I do kind of challenge you that, you know, I know numbers are sometimes intimidating to people. Um, we're trying to, you know, provide information to you that is not so much number focused, although you're going to see a lot of numbers, uh, but more policy focused and more um, kind of looking at the trends of where things are going because uh, the numbers will always change. Um, so just if you can kind of get the concepts and kind of the trends and the, uh, the policy issues, I think that that's more helpful to you as a council in terms of providing uh, oversight and guidance to this process. Okay. Right. Thank you, Council. Mayor. As Clay said, this is our second two-year budget that we put in as priority-based budgeting. And one of the things about priority-based budgeting is it really tries to start talking about the purpose. What are, what are, why do we have the departments? What are we trying to accomplish? So the first step I asked myself was, what's the purpose of the budget? And so the purchase of the budget is really to allocate resources to meet the the results required by the community as directed through the city council. So that's really what we're here about. It's to make sure that what we're doing today in the next two years meets the needs of the community as you guys tell us. And so the first step in this is you have to know what results you're looking for. And the city council a couple of years ago when we went through it came up with five results. The results are being fiscally prudent which means that Brisbane's fiscal vitality will reflect sound financial decisions, which also speak to the values of the community. It's to have a safe community, which is that residents and visitors will experience a sense of safety. It's about community building, which means that Brisbane will honor the rich diversity of our city, which includes our residents, our organizations, and our businesses through community engagement and participation. Uh, we also, the result we're looking for is having ecological sustainability, which means that Brisbane will be a leader in setting policies and practicing service delivery innovations that promote ecological sustainability. And then finally, it's about our last result we're look that Council directed us on was economic development, which means that Brisbane will work with the businesses and residents to provide for economic vitality and diversity. The second step, then, in a priority-based budget is to really define each of the <coughs> programs that the departments do 
and how that relates. So, you know, we've already defined the citywide programs. We did that last year, and those are, you know, we have that. And this year, we've really gone more into what the department and the divisions and how those are. And what you'll notice differently this in this year's budget, and I'll walk through it, is how the budget has been set up. Um, so, you know, our focus is on programs that meet the citywide goals. And this is the first pro this is the first budget we've done. It really breaks it down by department and division. And so here's what's different this year than what we've seen in the past. And I've taken finance as my example. So this year what you have is a budget that's truly a program-based budget. It breaks down each of the programs that we have um, by department and by division. And it sh then it shows you, for instance, in administration, what our cost of salaries for the administrative program is, what our payroll taxes are, what our benefits are for that program, what it costs us for insurance, and insurance is our workers' compensation and our liability insurance, and then what the cost of supplies and services are. And it goes, it goes program by program for each of the departments. The next thing that we did is we added charts. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that looking at a whole table full of numbers is not always very useful for people, so we have charts this year. Um, hopefully the colors work for people. I know I've tried to do colorblind for people who are colorblind, and it just did not work. But hopefully these colors are not that bad. Um, but once again, it shows you uh, by account category, so it gives you the entire department all at once. So it shows you how much, like for a finance department, how much we spend in salaries, what, we, what we've budgeted over the years, uh, what we've spent in supplies and services. And then it also breaks it down by program. So you can see either by program or you can see by account category. And what's really new this year is the, we've provided program purpose and commentary. Um, when we do our final budget, we're going to remove the commentary. But this is really the main focus of priority-based budgeting, which is to look at what it is that we're doing and then have the city council work and talk with staff as to what that really means and what, what you're really looking for out of all of these. And I, what here is I've shown two different exa two examples in the finance department talking about the accounting function which is to record, maintain, and report on the city's financial transactions according to the requirements of state and national standards. And we do this to ensure the city's funds are safe and financial information is presented in an understandable manner. So what I did is I went through the entire budget of everybody's programs, and I tried to be as, sometimes I was repetitive, sometimes I decided that after repeating myself three times in a department, I didn't need to continue to repeat myself. But I try to break down what are the kinds of questions that this raises? What are the kinds of measures that we're going to be looking for from the city council to know when we've achieved what we're trying to achieve? So for this instance, when you talk about standards, is do we, you know, the question is do we measure that we are in compliance with these standards or is, there, or is just doing the annual audit verification enough that we're doing what we need to do? Is there other ways that we should be measuring whether or not we're meeting what the state and national requirements are? And then we talk, talk about providing information in an understandable manner. Understandable to who is the question. You know, a lot of the times, the only people who read my audit is the bond buyers and the rating agencies. So their level of understanding is a lot different from the layperson who picks it up. So, and it's required to be at a, at a level for the, for the rating agencies, but does that really provide an understandable information for everybody else? So should we be looking at doing something else, like doing a more a layperson's annual report, which would be very different from what we do? And then, you know, how do we know that once we've distributed the information that it is understandable for people? You know, should we be surveying the public and asking them, do you understand what we're doing? So those are the kinds of things that, you know, when you start talking about how do we measure that we're achieving what we're trying to set out to achieve becomes an interesting question. You know, and then, you know, the question is, you know, for forecasting and budgeting, you know, provide a long-term financial picture of the city's revenues and expenditures, as well as ensuring annual budgets meet the requirements of the community. And that comes to the next question. How do we know we're meeting the requirements of the community? What does that look like? And those are the kinds of questions, I think, from a city council's perspective, when you're talking about what policies you're looking to achieve. Those are, those are really the big policy questions, because once you tell us you know, here's what we're trying to achieve as a city council, here's what we're trying to achieve as a community, we can then fashion the programs, we can fashion services that meets your needs. So that's really different this year than what we've done in the past. But then again, we get back to all the, a lot of the same old stuff, so let me get back into some of the old kinds of things that I've shown in the past. 
So in even years, in the budget process, we do the operating budget. The operating budget is what you have in front of you this year. And the operating budget, you know, council reviews citywide goals and performance measures. Staff develops programs to meet the goals, which is what we're talking about today. Staff develops proposed operating budget, which is the city manager's proposed budget. And then council reviews and hopefully adopts the operating budget at some point. And in odd years, we do the capital budget, and we just did that last year where you approved the capital budget. And, you know, we staff presents capital projects with applicable funding options, and then council reviews and adopts the two-year implementation plan, which you just did last year. Um, I really like to focus on the general fund because that's where most of our money gets spent and what the city council has the most discretion on. So for 2018-2019, the uh, revenue projections are 18.7 million and uh, expected expenditures are 19.7. So we're using a little bit under a million dollars of reserves in the 18-19 budget to meet all of the requirements that we have heard from the city council. And in 1920, um, you know, we're looking at getting revenues of 19.4 million roughly and expenditures of 20.2, 20.3. So the using less reserves in 1920 than in 1819. So that's a very positive sign that, you know, we're able to uh, be better off in 1920 than we are in 1819. But we're still spending, we're still spending well, I mean, it. it's almost the identical amount, really. It's a little bit less, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, closer to 800,000 than a million or 850, I think. Um, but yes, we are still using, we're still spending down our reserves, absolutely. And when we get to the fight, we get to the longer range um, financial plan, you'll see that we actually, in year three, we actually cross <coughs> um, uh, our major general rev our major revenues in the general fund are sales tax, which we're projecting at 4.4 million. Uh, recycling business license tax, we're projecting at 2.9, and the reason we're doing that is because the city council passed a resolution for that number already. Transient occupancy tax, we're projecting at 2.9, which is about what we're taking in this year. And property tax is 2.3 million. And just to let you know that the sales tax at 4.4 is a little bit lower than what our sales tax auditor is projecting. Our sales tax auditor projects at about 4,450,000. So again, one of the things I like to try and do is be as conservative as I can on revenue projections. And um, then we have a whole lot of new things in the budget this year, and I want to run through all of those so the city council is aware of any of all the new items that we have in our budget. Um, the departments will go more in depth, or if you have questions about them, you can talk to the departments. Uh, you know, we're looking at a contract for our, our OPEB and personnel costing software, uh, web hosting of electronic building records, homeless encampment, emergency pothole repair, pavement management system, uh, deep root watering, uh, corpyard surveillance system maintenance, trash enclosures for the community park, our annual weed abatement costs, emergency repairs and water system, uh, lead service identification project, which is obviously a water project, uh, annual weed abatement within the GVMID, emergency repairs in the GVMID, lead service identification project in the GVMID area, emergency <coughs> repairs and sewer, a uh, contract to provide two EOC trainings per year, uh, deep cleaning of the parks and recreation facilities that we have. It's been a while since we've done something like that, and we probably need it every year. Uh, child care modular supplies, uh, $2,500 in the first year, 5000 in the second, because in the first year we've got the new module, the rental coming in, and hopefully in the second year we'll have the permanent. Uh, pilot container storage project at the marina for 15000 and a workshop at the marina for 30000 so if you notice, there aren't, there aren't a lot of new items that are in the budget this year. Can I ask you a, a pilot container storage project? Yes. Uh, um, can, can you explain that a little more? I, I am sure Randy can. Um, oh. I believe it's that you're looking to be able to store things. For yes. The so, so pivoting off of some uh, comments we've heard from the council in uh, past sessions about having uh, containers down there and container homes and such, and also taking into consideration the request we've had from a lot of the boaters about having a place to store stuff. So we are going to get one container. It's, it's one of those seagoing containers that's been converted into a storage shed. And we're going to put it down there and, and just as a pilot system and see how it works. Do, you know, does it get used? Does it get rented? Is there a bigger demand for it? Does it fit in with the marina? Uh, and then see if we want to expand the project or not. Oh, okay. 20 foot or 40 foot? It'll be a 40, sir. 40? Okay. Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah. Um, are we going to make it look nice? So that's that's the plan. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So and, and Randy, that that will, are these general plan uh, items or that, is, would be, that will come out, the marina? come out of the marina? Okay, marina. What's workshop marina? Workshop for the marina? Yeah. That, that is that's not a uh, workshop like this. It's an actual work shed. So it's a an area for oh, the crew like to put their a maintenance workshop. equipment. Oh, like a workshop. Yeah, the the old uh, Fort Apache is what the old maintenance yard used to be called because there was a a large uh, old piling there with an arrow through it that's been demolished, and so we're just putting a, a place out there for the crew to work. Okay. All right. Okay. Then there are some items that are not in the budget that we have heard from different committees, the history committee, and I think uh, Madison uh, talked about this briefly at the last. Uh, council meeting is they're looking for fifty thousand um, dollars. Ten thousand dollars would digitize the ar some of the archive material that we have. The goal for that would be to ensure that the information that we have is available for people online, and they don't have to just come in here. So if you're trying to do research about our city, you don't have to be here in person. Uh, video history project, which Madison I think spoke uh, more, more extensively on, which is we're trying to capture the history of, the, of Brisbane and do this in a way that not only can you watch it, but you can also watch it online, watch it in person. Um, the cost for getting equipment, I've talked to Keith Moreau about it, and he's thinking it's going to be about $10,000 for us to be able to um, have our own equipment. Um, he is willing to volunteer his time to do the video recording. But in order to do that, what his suggestion is, because we do have like 40 or 50 people on our list, is to have like a basic permanent studio set up. So that way we don't have to keep taking it down and putting it up and taking additional time for that. Um, and then the staff for history committee, we're thinking it's going to be about $30,000. And what this would do, as Madison spoke about, is to schedule everybody. It's to help us through the digitization digitization process it's to do research on what are the topics that we want to talk to people about just having a conversation with a person isn't very interesting unless you the person knows what you're going to ask them and you know what topics you really want to cover um, so we see that you know so the history committee really sees that as an important aspect of all of this um, and not expecting staff to be able to find enough time to be able to schedule that many interviews and to do that much research then the Parks and Recreation Commission has a number of things on their list again, as they have in the past. Uh, they're looking for Firth Park improvements, uh, improvements to the Sunrise Room, uh, money for new special events. As you know, we like to do some pop-up events, and they're thinking we should do more. Uh, putting a drop-down screen for the for Mission Blue, as opposed to trying to reset it up every time. This would uh, save time and effort and money from for that. Uh, we need to replace the sound system at Mission Blue. Anybody who's been up there knows that the sound system um, after being t used for 20 years is in need of replacement uh, we need to replace the light board um, right now um, you know doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to in special events portable sound system and as you know when we do things like outdoor kinds of events where we need a sound system I think you remember from our last uh, attempt at um, the festival of lights the sound system was not quite up to speed um, if we have the same problems when we were doing stuff at, you know, day in the park. So that's what the Parks and Recreation Commission is requesting. Neither, none of those items are in the budget at this point in time. Um, but what is also in the budget, as Clay talked about, we've been setting money aside for vehicles. Um, we've got a new fire engine that we're purchasing. Um, the marina is purchasing a club car electric vehicle. Uh, we need to replace the Crown Victoria at, for Parks and Recreation. It's reached its useful life. And we know we can't replace it with the Crown Victoria. Um, they don't make those anymore. That's how old it is. We need a new van for Parks and Recreation. Uh, police needs to replace one of their Tauruses. Again, it's not going to probably be with a Taurus. Uh, police needs to expo replace a, uh, an Explorer, and Public Works needs a backhoe. Um, and all this money is available in the Vehicle Replacement Fund. There is no need to put additional money for these vehicles, and that's why we set aside the vehicle replacement fund. And then in 1920, uh, Fire needs to replace their che their Chevy Tahoe. Marina needs to replace an EasyGo. Public Park uh, Police needs to replace three more vehicles, and Public Works has a truck that, that it needs to replace. And again, all these have been, money has been set aside previously for these. Um, one of the things that, you know, we do talk about 
um, and a lot of times is this how have we done in the past so what I did is take um, a snapshot of the last seven years and looked at you know how did I do in my projections of my budgets versus my actuals uh, fiscal year 2010 2011 you know we were still like that tail end of the recession and our actual revenues were below our projected revenues but since then our actual revenues have been above our projected revenues and I'm hoping to continue that streak in the upcoming budget by being slightly conservative on my projections. Um, and then actual expenditures versus uh, projected expenditures. Um, as you see, in most years, our actual revenues are below our projected expenditures. And you know this speaks well to the departments. You know They buy the things that they need. If something that they thought they needed at the beginning of the year, they find out they don't need, they don't purchase it. Um, and one of the things that I think really encourages that is that we don't we don't hold that against them later at later times. A lot of times when you're doing budgets, what you'll find is cities will say that if you don't spend all your money in one year, not only do you not get the money carried over to the next year from what you didn't use, but you also, since you didn't spend it all in that year, you must not need it in the next year. So if you budget a hundred thousand in one year for something, and you only spent eighty thousand we're only going to budget 80000 in the next year. Um, what this does is it encourages departments to spend money at the end of the year, so they spend every dime that they got budgeted for them because they don't know if they're going to need it in the next year. Um, I, I learned this example early in my life when I was doing a project uh, in my graduate school in Syracuse. The best paved parking lot in all of Syracuse was the Public Works parking lot because every year that when they budgeted for their black, for their uh, blacktop uh, for roads. If they did not spend all their money, they redid their parking lot. So every year they redid their parking lot. It was a well paved parking lot. I'm sure. Um, at that time, I learned that you don't, you know, that's a, it doesn't really serve a purpose. Because what you're really doing is you're encouraging people to spend money they don't need. Um, as opposed to doing what, you, what we should be doing, which is if you don't need the money, put it back into the reserves so that way the city council can distribute it to where it needs best to go. So over the years, I've, you know, over the last number of years, we've done well. We've uh, spent less than we've budgeted, and we've taken in more than we've budgeted. And, you know, the fund balance has shown this through the years. We've gone, you know, in 04, 05, we had $9.6 in our fund balance. We went up to a high of 14, in 14, 15 of $14.5 million. Um, in 16, 17, uh, we're at $11.6 million. Uh, and these are the actuals. Um, and during that period of time, we've also spent $4 million out of fund balance. Um, so in addition to growing fund balance by a little over $2 million since 04, 05, we've also been able to spend $4 million in addition to that. These were things that we were needed. So right after the recession, we spent $1.4 million cap, uh, catching up on a number of capital projects that we needed to do. Uh, we've put $1.2 million into the OPEB trust. Um, we've put over a million dollars from the general fund into the motor vehicle replacement fund, which is why we can now buy those vehicles without impacting the general fund's fund balance. Uh, we put $300,000 into the maintenance fund, and we're putting $250,000 a year in there as well. We've put $100,000 in the pension trust fund, and we're in, you know, we've got more money going into that as well. So we've done a very good job in finding what the needs are of the community, and as we save money, we put them into these. Into these. Uh, and I apologize for the size of this one, um, but this is our fiscal model. This is one of the things that we talk about. Um, as you see, the blue line does cross the red line in fiscal year 2021 and, 20, and 2022. Um, but we are slightly below, you know, we're projecting to be slightly below the fund balance reserve in those last couple of years as well. Because as the budget grows, our reserves that we need grow as well. Um, but then again, I'm not quite sure that we're going to actually, you know, I think we will be better off than we are. So I think, you know, given how close those lines are, I don't really see that as being a long-term problem at this point. And since our revenues are growing, fa you know, growing faster than our expenditures, I think that, you know, in the long term, we will be okay. Uh, one of the things that you, uh, uh, Council Member O'Connell, asked me to do is to try and explain PERS. Um, you've asked me to do this as fast as I possibly can, so I will uh, take heed of that. 
Um, so Earth here we go. One. <laughs> Earth 101. If you if if you enjoy this, I'll, then we can go up to the upper level of 201 next week. Uh huh. Uh -huh. This is where my this is where everybody behind me starts sleeping. So, um, how is PERS funded? I think this is the first basic question that everybody has: is how do we pay for how do we pay for PERS? PERS is Stuart, the employee. Maybe, maybe oh, okay. Go ahead. Is the employee? Um, uh, it's the retirement system for the, for the employees, for both our public safety and for our non-safety employees. Um, so the way that our city PERS account is funded is you have a you have three different pools of money going into it. You have what the city contributes, what the employees contribute, and the investment earnings. All those three go into the PERS account. The next question that people ask is, how do we know how much money the city should be contributing? So we contribute uh, the normal cost plus the, the amount we need to pay off our unfunded liability, and that gets to our annual city payment. And you're probably asking me what the normal cost is and how do we determine it. <coughs> um, so the normal cost is what it costs for an employee to be here for that year that they're here and what we think it's going to, what we're going to need to save for them to pay for them in their retirement. So the normal cost is based off of the expected working lifetime of an employee. So do we think they're going to work for 30 years, 10 years, or whatever? It's based off of the expected age of retirement, um, the expected life expectancy for employees, um, expected pay raises over, the, over, their over their lifetime, and then expected rate return on investments. So that's what makes up the normal cost. Um, what makes up our unfunded liability? is it changes based on investment income below, which is what creates an unfunded liability, or above expected. And if we had more than we expected in investments, we would have a net positive in assets. That hasn't happened for a number of years, but it has happened in the past. And then also changes to assumptions. So as I said before, you know, we have a lot of assumptions about how long a person's going to work, what age they retire, how long they're going to live, what their pay raises are going to be, and what the return on, and the other one's return on investment. So, if somebody actually works longer than we anticipated, that would decrease our un that would decrease our liability, because in fact we would have to pay them less years. If they retire earlier, then our liability goes up, because we're going to have to pay them for more years. If they retire later than expected, our liability goes down. Um, left expected life expectancy. If people live longer, liability goes up. People live shorter, liability goes down. Pay raises, um, if we give higher than expected pay raises, liability goes up. Lower than expected pay raises, liability goes down. Uh, the city has five different tiers of PERS, depending on when you got hired. We have tier one for miscellaneous employees or non-safety. Uh, mis calling them miscellaneous seems bad, so I like to say non-safety. PERS calls them miscellaneous. Um, so we have tier one is 2.7 at 55. Um, that means for every year that you work, you get 2.7% of your highest, single highest pay, highest year um, at the age of 55, and it doesn't change after 55. So if you started working at 25, you retire at 55, you're, entire, you're entitled to 81% of your single highest year. And it doesn't have to be your last year of pay. It could be any year that was your single highest year of pay. So, for instance, if you were working in, you know, and obviously, you know, we are in one of the higher pay areas, but if you start, if you're working here and you take a job in the Central Valley and you get paid less, your single highest year would be based on what you earned here. And it works the other way, too, whereas if you come out of the Central Valley and you come here, it's based on your single highest year here, so all of your PERS retirements would be based on that. And all... The other, and every city you work for pays into that. Um, our tier two, uh, so when the city council adopted the 2.7 to 55, we recognized that that was not a sustainable model for the city. And so what we said is that and new employees would be getting two at 60. Um, the previous one was two at 55. So we went from two at 55 for employees to 2.7 at 55. And then the city council said, yeah, yeah, we can go to the 2.7, but only for the employees that are here. Going forward, we, need, you know, we would like to have a reduced pension cost. So we went to Tier 2, which was 2 at 60. And the city council was one of the first cities in the state 
to go to the second tier. Mm -hmm. And that was just, you know, again, trying to make those long-term financial decisions for the city. Um, so that's two at 60. Now two at 60 um, actually rises to 2.3 at 63. So it does actually grow a little bit after you hit 60. So if you're, you know, if you work until you're 63, you'd actually get 2.3% of your um, single highest year. And then tier three is the PEPRA, which was put in by the state. So this is at the moment, the only tier that's available for new employees, which is two at 62, which is not that much different from our two at 60. Uh, safety, or we have one, we have tier one, which is for, you know, the employees who were here at the time, was three at 55. Um, this is another one of those ones where the um, employees came in and requested three at 50, and I think Council Member Conway was on council at the time. Um, and we said, if you're willing to pay for going from three at 50 to three at 55, that would make sense to us, but we're not going to pay for it ourselves because we recognize the cost, and the employees decided they did not want to pay for it. So we stayed at three at 55, and I think um, we benefited from that versus a lot of other cities that went to three at 50. Mm -hmm. When PEPRA came in, they went to 2.7 at 57. So those are the five tiers that we have. So talking about unfunded liability, and this is for the miscellaneous tier or our non-safety tier. Uh, so you want so this is how we this is how you figure out what your unfunded liability is. Um, and our unfunded liability as of the June 2016 was 10.2 million dollars for our tier one uh, non-safety employees. Um, so it's a bunch of different things. It's an asset loss in 2013 of $3.3 million. So that means that the, we had less than expected return on investment. And we had 27 more years to pay that off. So what PERS does is determine what, how many years you have to pay off the, uh, the loss that you have. Uh, we have a share of the pre-2013 pool. Um, UAL. So we are in a pool. Um, the reason that we are in a pool versus being out on our own in PERS is because we are a small city. And what they had noticed back in the 2000, I think it was like 2010 time frame, that small cities actually have a very large fluctuation in their PERS costs year to year because when you have somebody retire early, it creates a big, uh, bigger unfunded liability. If you only have <coughs> a very few employees, that, um, that becomes a big percentage of your overall income. Whereas if you spread it out amongst a lot of employees, any one early retirement or disability retirement doesn't have that big of an effect on the entire pool. So that's why we went into a pool. And we can never get out. Once you're in, you're net, no matter how much we grow, you can never get out. Um, so that cost for us is $4 million in unfunded liability. There were some non-asset losses, and those are probably changes in some kinds of assumption, uh, what happened with some, what happened in actuality versus the changes in assumption. Uh, we had another, we actually had an asset gain in 2014, so that reduced our unfunded liability by $2.5 million. Uh, we, there were some assumption changes in 2014, which increased the... Um, liability by 1.6. We had an asset loss in 2015 for 1.5, non-asset gain for 128,000, an asset loss for 1.8, non-asset gain for 232, an assumption change for 547. That all adds up to $10.2 million. I will tell you that for what we've heard is as of June, for June 2017, they actually had an asset gain. So we will see a decrease in our unfunded liability based on that, but we don't get those numbers until Octo until August or October. So they're always running at least a year behind in what they give us. That's why you're seeing 2016 that that got sent to us in October of 2017. So I can give you an update in October of 2018 where we are, but that would still only be through 2017. Um, so rules for paying our unfunded liability. Uh, prior to 2018, if you noticed on this chart, there was like a lot of different kinds of years that we had to pay it off on, 27, 18, 29, and the question is why. So for pre-2018 gains and losses on assets, we would, have a th we would have 30 years to pay it off, and it would be a five-year ramp up and ramp down. So when you do a five-year ramp up and ramp down, is your, if you do a ramp up, you're actually borrowing money <coughs> 
um, longer. So you actually increase your unfunded liability, and you know you're going to increase your unfunded liability. Um, an assumption change, well, if they made an assumption change, that would only be, we'd only have 20 years to pay that off as opposed to 30 years, and they didn't do a ramp up and ramp down. Post-2018, there was a change in the law, so their gains and losses leveled dollar over a 20-year period. Um, from assets, there's a ramp up period, so we're still going to be borrowing money, but there's no ramp down period. And then otherwise, there are no ramps. So that will help us um, pay off our unfunded liability sooner, and the sooner you pay off a loan, the less you pay in interest. So all these things are going to help us in the long term, but it will cost us money in the short term. Um, so I did an abbreviated pavement schedule for what our Tier 1 uh, looks like for our uh, non-safety employees. So in 2018, um, our, and so this is coming off of the PERS actuary study that was given to me that ended as of June 2016. So it will look different uh, you know, when I get the new one June 17, but as of June, 1000, June 2016, uh, we owed, as of June 2018, we were going to owe 10.8 million, million, and then the highest that was going to grow was going to be to 11 million in 2022. And then what I did was I picked the highest year that we were going to need to make a payment on it, which was 2031, where we're going to need to make $1.2 million of a payment. And then I picked the next time that we were going to get back close to what we were paying in 2018, which would be um, in 2040, and then we have it all paid off in 2047. So if we just wait long enough, we're all done. Um, I think and, we'll wait. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we'll be there. We'll, we'll be there. Uh, you know, and one of the things when you think about... If I live long enough, yeah, I'll be 95. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be, but they... Hey. Hey. I, I remember will that. Be, yeah. will be here. I'll be here. You, you know, and he'll be here. <laughs> that is it here, yeah. <laughs> we're still not... We're you still not... Hopefully. Yeah. We're still not burying you is what I'm you're telling me. <laughs> yeah, not you. See, Madison's got that quip every time. Every time. Yeah, I'll be here. You know, <laughs> a millennial. I'm hoping to be here in 2040, to be alive in 2047, <laughs> not working. If I'm working, my, my retirement did not work out for me. Um, you do it for the love. I do it work. for the love. At that point, I'd be doing it for the love. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those, you know, one of the questions when you start talking about paying for your unfunded liability and should you pay it off sooner or should you pay it off later? Um, it's like the same thing when you're thinking about making your house payment. You know, when you borrow your money and you buy a house for 30 years, the question is, you know, should I pay it off sooner or should I, you know, should I pay it off over the 30-year period? Um, should I put extra payments into it and reduce my interest payments? Or should I take my money and invest it someplace else? And those are all the same kinds of questions that you ask yourself when you're looking at paying for unfunded liability questions. Uh, my projections have the anticipated increases in the PERS um, calculated in there. So, yeah, you know, we still will be able to make our payments. Um, but the question, and I think, you know, we can spend a lot more time on it, and I don't want to, you know, I didn't think today was going to be the day everybody wanted to spend time delving into PERS, and that's why I'm only showing you miscellane the miscellaneous tier one. We can do the same conversation about um, our safety tier one, because it's an, that also has about $10 million worth of unfunded liability, and our OPEB has about $8 million of unfunded liability. They all work exactly the same way. And that's why I, I picked one as an example. They'll all be by 2047. Well, tier one for, yes, everything will be, yeah, we will be completely paid off of all those unfunded liabilities by 2047 if we make our annual payments as we're anticipating. All three. All three of those would, okay. yeah. But um, it does mean that our total unfunded liability is more like $28 million. Or yes. Two, yes. Yeah, $28 million. It's about $28 million. Um, and, you know, and... You know, looking at it from a, the same kind of idea that when you look at it from a, you know, making your house payment, <coughs> you, know, you get back to the question, your house payment is, can you make that payment? Can you afford to make the payment? And does it become easier over time? With a house payment, it does become easier over time because your house payment doesn't usually increase unless you have a variable rate mortgage. You know, you're, so as, you, as your income goes up, the payment as a percentage of your income goes down, so it becomes easier over time. Uh, and that's why PERS is going to the point where, where PERS has changed their philosophy from having a ramp up and a ramp down and paying it as a percentage of payroll to having flat payments because they, they recognize 
that that's costing cities interest that they didn't that they should not be paying or don't have to be paying. Um, but you know, as I said, I think we we have the ability to make these payments over time. And then when you look at the overall liability of twenty-eight million dollars, that's not all general fund, but a lot of it is because most of our employees are in the general fund. Um, our general fund revenues are about eighteen million. So you know, if you look at it from a how you do your house payment in our in today's atmosphere, if you're able to have a you know, if you're able to have a house loan that is less than two times your annual income, you're doing very well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, from those perspectives, I, you know, this, the unfunded liability is not something that's overbearing on us at this point in time. You know, I, I think if you look at it and say, you know, if we have a major recession and you have a, another asset loss in PERS, another big asset loss, at the same time that we're reducing our, um, that our revenues are going down, it becomes harder to make those payments. And that's why, you know, staff is encouraged and uh, I think uh, Councilmember O'Connell has encouraged us to put more money aside for these unfunded liabilities. And we have been. You know, we, in our budget this year, in addition to making the PERS payment as required, in addition to making our annual repayment for uh, OPEB as required, we're also setting aside an additional $100,000 into um, additional trust funds that can make those payments. So we are looking to say how can we make those, how we can pay those down quicker. Um, one, uh, another approach for making, for paying off your unfunded liability, um, and if you would like, we can bring it back, is to borrow money. We've done it in the past, and it works well if you think that what your rate of borrowing money is going to be lower than what you think you're going to earn on your money. So in the past, we, tra you know, PERS was thinking they were going to earn about eight and a quarter percent on their money, so that they were loaning us money at eight and a quarter percent. And then uh, we were able to sell bonds at somewhere in the 4% range. So, you know, we were able to reduce our payments um, while at the same time saving money. Uh, we have that same ability at this point in time if we would like. We could go out and borrow $20 million, pay off this, pay this off. It's about 4% to borrow money at this point in time. Um, PERS is expecting about 7% rate of return, so we have a 3% cushion. Um, the downside is if we borrow money and then PERS loses money, then it, it costs us than if we hadn't done it that way. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gamble. We've taken the gamble in the past because you know, it seemed like there was enough of a cushion there. There may be less of a cushion in, today, in what we think of today. Um, one of the challenges that PERS has is that they've lowered, they're lowering their assumption for future um, interest earnings from 7.5% down to 7%, and that will increase some of our unfunded liability. And I called PERS, uh, or I spoke to our, the actuary who works on our account, and I said, can you give me an idea of what that means? I said, because if I do the simple math, it looks as if it will mean that our unfunded liability is going to go up 10%. And our payments would go up somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent range every year, based on how funded we are. And he says, "What you're saying makes sense. However, you can't say that because if we have a positive year, your unfunded liability goes down. If we, you know, so he wasn't willing to commit to anything, which is why I could not commit to anything on a chart today because they told me not to. But yes, our unfunded liabilities are going to go up um, based on that change, um, and those are the numbers that I've actually." done my best guess to put into our estimates as to when those costs go up. So even given the 7% range, I think we're, you know, we'll still be okay. The biggest challenge, though, with PERS is that although they are expecting 7% rate of return on their money, over the next 10 years, they're expecting a 6% rate of return. So over the next six years, we're going to see our unfunded liability increase even if PERS does what's anticipated. And then what they think is they're going to get back to their normal rate of return, which is closer to eight and a quarter percent after the ten years. So over a twenty-year period, they will be fine. So the challenge I think that cities are going to need to live through for the next ten years is to live through their unfunded liability increasing, and then recognize that it will decrease equally after that fact. Um, I think that's going to be a real challenge for cities that are looking at budgeting year to year as opposed to budgeting over time. 
Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the smart move at this point would be to l go with what PERS is, is anticipating. The reason why they are reducing their expected rate of return to 6% is because of fixed income earnings. Um, you know, one of the things that PERS doesn't talk, you know, I, this is my short version. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. This no, is it's actually excellent. No, no. Sure. No, that's okay. This, this is great. I, uh, so the reason why we were at eight and a quarter of a percent. I'm doing that because I had a pain, not, no. not, not because of your presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Don't be so defensive. You're I am, I am. Physical, a physical I'm embodiment, man, not one down. Your... <laughs> See what you did? You're on a blower. Right now. <laughs> so it's not blow. No, the blower. The air conditioning. Air conditioning blowing. Can we turn it down a little? Anyway, so the reason why PERS used to be at eight and a quarter percent is because if you remember back in the 70s, you could buy a CD for five years and get 10 or 12% on a CD. Yeah. So if you can buy a 12% CD at zero risk, yeah. you're easily making 8%. So as the fixed income revenue came down, they needed to earn more on their, on their uh, stock, stock market portfolio. Um, so when we got down to one or two percent, and they uh, they were about forty percent invested in fixed income and about sixty percent invested in variable income products. So as you go from a twelve percent rate of return, where you can easily make eight percent a year, and you come down to one percent, so if you're making one percent uh, or two percent on 40% of your portfolio, that, that, that gives you a return of eight-tenths of a percent. That means you, the other 60% of your portfolio needed to earn 7.4% and needed to net out. So 40% of them, you know, you're talking about needing to earn 12 to 13% on your variable rate portfolio. The stock market traditionally returns 10%. So therefore, they were, of course, going to be below the 8% that they had projected. And you know, and now they're thinking because fixed income is still at a relatively low level, they think they're going to be at six percent. So there's two things that are going to happen, um, and we're seeing it right now: is the fixed income is coming back to normal. You know, where you know you can buy a five-year bond for two and a half percent, but 30-year bonds are still in the three percent range. That's still below what you would expect. Inflation is three percent. So basically, when you do a 30-year bond, you're giving somebody money for no, for no interest. That still doesn't make sense. I mean, normally you would loan money for 2 or 3%. So we would still expect to see over the next 20 years the fixed income portfolio to increase in value or decrease in value but increase in interest earnings. And so therefore your, your variable rate products need, can actually don't need to return as much so you can, t you can take less risk there. And that's what PERS is, is banking on over the next 20 to, th you know. And as you can tell, they look at life over a 60-year period, because they know they're going to be here forever. Um, they know, you know, our, you know, we have people who are in Tier 1 who are 37 years old. They've got another 50 years to live. So, you know, they're, you know the last payment that we will be making actuarially on our Tier 1 payment is going to be in the year 2070. So we will still be paying off people in 2070 who, who we hired under Tier 1. And that's what PERS is saying, is over that kind of a period of time, we can reasonably expect 7%. And that's probably a true, that's probably really accurate. Um, on the short term, we might see that change, but I think, you know, PERS, uh, you know, pensions is a long-term product, and you need to think about it as a long-term, and it's a forever product. We're not going away, we're not going to go away as a city, um, unless something really drastic happens. Um, so I think we need to be thinking of those kinds of things when we're talking about how do we tackle our PERS and our OPEB payments. So that's, yes, that does, and I can, that concludes PERS 101. Now, if you want, I can go back for PERS 201 and be even more in depth. Well, that's very good. If anybody has any questions. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I really like, you know, your philosophy of looking at the budget over time. Yeah, and just really giving us that that long term perspective. Because you really do need to do that. And you know, just like when you have a mortgage, as you, you gave that example. You know, yeah, initially it's it's tough making those first payments, but then over time you 
it becomes an adjustment and and then it's what you do over the next 30 years and if you make some extra money and you can pay down that mortgage so you can not have that that debt that you're expecting at the end of the 30 years um you know you're better off for it and i'm glad that we're doing that with the hundred thousand dollars uh, you know and just also to let you know one of the things and i have it in some of the in the new costs for us but one of the ongoing costs is that we do have a we have purchased a contract with a company called gov invest which does pers projections um, and they can make you can change your assumptions you can change what you think pers is going to make you can change how much money you want to put aside for it um, you can change what you think the your anticipated salary increases are going to be you can change the number of employees you have and you can do all those things and then determine what your new unfunded liability is going to be and how you and what the impacts of all those kinds of assumption changes will be and you know and as I say if you want to go into a purse 201 more than happy at some point to show that product off because we're also going to look to be buying it for our OPEP to make sure that we have a better understanding as to what well, all the factors for everything Stuart, um, you know on PERS, how, how does it work uh, like with uh, an employee that worked in another jurisdiction? So let's, let's, let's use the example of the officer we had uh, introduced the other night that worked for a, a similar thing. They were at 3% at 55, mm -hmm. right? And so transfers, you know, hired into Brisbane. That transfers over to, or is that, does well, that change? No, so, well, so... I'll use myself as an example because I have the same thing. I worked in Encinitas for seven years mm -hmm. before um, back in the early 90s or back during the 90s. So there I'm at two at 55 and uh, there. So I'm always going to be 2% at 55 there. Um, but they also have single highest year. So when I was there, I think my salary was about $60,000. I'm making more than that now. So they're going to have to pay... 12%, which the two, so that if I was there for six years, two at 55, if I retire at 55, 12%, they'll be paying 12% of my retirement income. So, um, and then Brisbane will pay, if I work 20 years here at 55, be 54%. So 54% of my 54% of my single high share would be being paid for by Brisbane. So you don't, so every city carries their own liability, and that's part of what that's part of the challenge when you move from a lower paying city to a higher paying city. Um, the anticipated pay raises up until t up until this year was three percent a year, because uh, on average that's about what employees get over their lifetime. Um, so, as an employee who now has higher than three percent for for um, Encinitas. They have. Cre I've created an unfunded liability for them. Mm -hmm. But because they come from experience, though. I mean, what I'm saying though is, is or they fall under that two percent? No. Fifty-seven oh. now. Yes. Or? No. So <clears throat> they will fall. That no. They they stay with a three at fifty-five. If they were hired pre two thousand and thirteen in their old city, they would stay at three at fifty-five because they would stay at our tier at our tier one. But if we have a non-safety employee who is working in another city yeah. prior to 2013, they come in at our Tier 2. Oh, in the, for, they don't come in at Tier 1. They come in at Tier 2 because our Tier 2 was in place before PEPRA was put into place. Okay. Right. So it depends if you're safety or if you're non-safety non okay. as to where you come. Right. So, so, you know, i got a question to follow up on that. So, uh, so using your example, Stuart, so, you know, obviously, you know, when you were working at the other city, you were just starting, so your your salary was lower. Now you're a director of a department. You're making more. Would that city, Encinita, Encinitas, Encinitas, um, would they be required when you retire to pay your yes. highest pay? Okay, so yes. that's what you're talking about. Now you've created an unfunded liability for them. For them, okay. Yes. It's going to be hard for those cities that uh, it is. Yeah. So the real challenge. Or out of the higher paying uh, areas right yeah. so, and PERS is trying to address that and this is going this is going to be an interesting challenge um, what PERS is looking to do is creating another rule to, and they're trying to determine that if you as a hiring city create an undue burden 
and they're trying to de de determine what an undue burden is on another city, then you have to pick up the cost of the of you have to pick up a portion of that cost mm. that you put on the other city. So you know it, it becomes really apparent if you are a I'm not gonna you know not to pick on police but to pick on the police department if you are a police chief in a small central valley town or a San Bernardino border town or a northern town and you're earning $120,000 as a police chief and you come into the Bay Area and you earn 200000 that town is not expecting you to work your last three years at 200000 So they've created a, you know, you could be 27 years for a town, at, you know, and top out at 120, work three years at 200. Your entire your entire retirement is now based off of 200. This town that has three at 55 is now responsible for 81 percent of 200,000. So they're responsible for about 160,000 when they were expecting to spend about 100,000. Yeah. So uh, Purse is saying that doesn't seem fair to that that city that was paying only 120,000, and they're trying to come up with a rule that makes <clears throat> sense. The challenge with that is, is it may create some inability to have people move to, you know, to be able to get trans to, to be where they need to be. Yeah, you might be stuck in and, a and, town out in the valley, and you don't want to be there all your, you know, right. your entire career. You, and you may like be a really good police else. chief and not be able to come to a, a better city, yeah. a bigger city. So, yeah, so Purse is going through that process now, trying to figure out how to make all that make sense. Mm -hmm. Because that is a challenge. Is you create, you know, especially if you're a small city, and, you know, and you have a very small pool of assets, that's a very large increase. So it's kind of, you know, yeah. They, they, I, I hope they do come up with something that's fair because that, that's not right. Yeah, you know, yeah. It'll it'll be a challenge for them. Treat your employees good, right? It would also be a challenge for a hiring director in that more expensive city to say, well, we're looking at hiring someone where we're going to have <laughs> twenty-seven extra years of, of yes. pension responsibility to make for the makeup difference. To bring you in. Right. Yeah. And and I'm not sure legally can you look at that in hiring. No. You cannot look at people's past salaries as a part of hiring. I mean that was state law that just passed. So it would be I mean you can good make assumption. assumptions. Yeah. Yes. And not admit that you're making those assumptions, but it, You could find other reasons for make for choosing somebody as a better fit for the organization. Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's this is uh, pensions has become a big issue. Um, you know, pensions is a you know for cities that. I mean, I, I will say, working for Brisbane is I, I as a finance person, I feel very fortunate. We have a we have a diverse revenue base. You know, if you look at our revenues, they're fairly secure. You know, going back to what our four biggest sources are. You know, the recycling business license tax is fixed. And that's, you know, our second largest revenue source. Um, transient occupancy tax, it will fluctuate a little bit during recessions. I mean, we saw that. But it's not, I mean, we are in the number two destination place in the United States, maybe three, number three, maybe Vegas is number one, New York number two, San Francisco number three. Um, South San Francisco is growing by leaps and bounds as businesses you know, our our point is growing by, with businesses. So our transient occupancy tax is not going to drop by 50% in any given year. Our sales tax, you know, it's, you know, unfortunately VWR left, which was a great sales tax producer and a fairly stable sales tax producer, but because they left, our our sales tax has become more diverse. So, you know, yes, if we have a construction slowdown, Golden State Lumber is going to have a reduction, but we have other businesses that will not. So you know, our sales tax, yeah, we will lose money. That's why we have money set aside in reserves. And then property tax, property tax is fairly stable. I mean, it may, de it may dip for a little bit during a recession as properties are not getting reassessed up or if we lose value a little bit. But over time, it'll grow right back to where it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so from that perspective, you know, yeah, you know, that's four, five, you know, what is that, six million not 10, 12, 12 and a half million dollars out of 
18, 19 million dollars in revenue is through those four, which are fairly stable revenue sources. And, and the recycling business license tax is going to go up yes. uh, significantly yes. in the next few years. Yes. And 2.9 is the beginning of that, but yes. So I have a question on the uh, property tax um, valuations. Are your projections for this year including the completion of the HDP properties out at the marina? Um, no. Um, the reason being is that that's still in the successor agency area. So that's okay. so there. So that money has the first the first call on that is goes to the successor agency. So we will get a portion of it. We'll, um, but we I do not put that in because that's not really being put in through the county's projections yet, because they don't know what that number will be when it's all said and done. Okay. So we'll see that go up a little bit more as well. Okay, and if a major property gets sold and reassessed? So if a major property gets sold and gets reassessed, we actually don't see the, rev we don't see the revenue in our property tax for two years. Um, the, the county has a, we get money through the supplemental property tax, mm -hmm. which if you look at the, all the tax revenues we get, that's one of our revenues. The supplemental property tax is a, I don't under, I don't understand it. I don't understand how the county does it um, because I don't think that I, I would I would disagree with the way they do it, but that's how they do it. Um, so when they do supplemental property tax and a, and a, something gets reassessed in the middle of the year, it goes into a pool of money that gets distributed throughout the entire county, um, and it gets distributed based on what they call your AB8 factor. Your AB8 factor is the percentage of property tax that you have received versus the overall percentage of property tax collected within the county. So let's say our two per, let's say our two million dollars is one percent of the overall county. So all the properties that are sold within the year, we get one percent of their value of that increase in value, no matter where it was. So we would get one percent of a house sold in Hillsboro, and we would get one percent of the increase in a house sold in Brisbane. But two years down the road, it then hits our property tax, and we would see it two years later. Okay. It's kind of, to me, that's a weird way of doing it, because I would think you would know where the property was. <laughs> but that's how they do it, and they tell me that's the way that they're legally required to do it. And I'm, I understand it. I understand the formula. I just don't understand. I don't get why it works, why they do it that way. Mm. It's weird. And new construction is considered a supplemental property yes. tax? Yes. Yep. So any new construction? Any new construction would be considered supplemental. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it works the same way if you have a decrease, and that's the nice thing. So if you lost a piece of property during the year, somebody got a reassessment down, you don't lose the entire reassessment in that year, which is a nice thing, except we are going to all take a hit because of Genentech's when they get reassessed down. And that's again. I don't. Why are they going to get reassessed down? Um, because they've been having, they have been arguing with the county for the last fifteen years over their assessed value, and they've filed an appeal every year for fifteen years that they're over that they're over assessed. And they will ultimately win a certain amount. Is what we're told. <laughs> they're robbing me. <laughs> I mean, it was... Break out the violins. Yeah, well, you know, it was also the interest... The little the, ones. The most interesting uh, one was when the guy who owns Oracle, Larry... Larry Ellis. Larry Ellis. He built a house for $300 million in Hillsboro, Woodside. I don't know. Woodside. Woodside. Um, and then he appealed the assessment, and it cost... Building permits cost $300, mil, 300 million. He appealed because he says that it was a unique style of house, and because it was a unique style of house, it wasn't worth it co that to it anybody cost, else. It cost more to build the first time than it would cost the second time to rebuild, because they had to learn how to build it. So he re he appealed the three hundred million dollar assessment and won. It's like your house cost you three hundred million. So I mean, there's uh, assessed. You know, as much as I enjoy finances and. Projections, assess, that assessing a piece of property is the strangest thing. And then how it works through the state formula becomes even stranger. Weird. Are, are you finished with your presentation? I had one last okay, slide. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Which was the next steps. 
Like, where do we go from here? Um, so there are three additional OCIPs that we need to review, and we'll do that, uh, you know, at a up at later meeting. That was one of the things that the city council asked us to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I do that I, that you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth today, today because I know we're trying to get through the budget at some at this point, because uh, you have a lot of other important issues you guys are focusing on. Is that we need a rate increase in the marina. Uh, we haven't done an operational rate increase for a number of years. The last rate increase we did was for the dredging, and it was a large increase. It was 10% a year for three years. But part of the requirements of the bond that we sold to do the dredging is that we need to ensure that we collect 125% of our operational costs. Um, two years ago, um, in 16, 17, we did not collect 125% of our operational cost. Mm -hmm. Our bond holder called us, because we sold it to a bank, called us and said, you know, you did not collect 125%. I said, yes, we were not planning to. We put a rate increase over time, and, you know, last year was the last of the years. And we, you know, and I showed them um, in seven, 17, 18, we're going to make the 125%. Um, assuming my numbers are right for 18, 19, we'll make the 125%. And in 1920... It's going to be close. I think I've got a six thousand dollar cushion in 1920, uh, but we haven't done an operate. You know, we haven't increased and inf had an inflationary increase for at least five years over at the marina. So in the fall, I'll be bringing you back probably a three percent increase and talk about you know what do we need to do to ensure that we are able to meet our our bond requirements. So that will be you'll be seeing that in the fall. You'll give us a range on that. Yes. And then, you know, the other one is, you know, do we want to look at, do we want to go more in depth on PERS and OPEB and figure out a way to maybe pay it down faster so we pay less in interest? I mean, it's the same thing with your house. The quicker you pay it down, the less you pay in interest costs. And you might say, you, you might say as you do with your house that it's okay because I'm going to earn more in the future and therefore I'm willing to pay more in the future. But I think that's, we should spend a little bit of time going through PERS and OPEB when we have more time as a council to really focus on that topic because it's, you know, as um, Councilwoman O'Connell points out, it's a $28 million liability to us. And, you know, if, you, if we're paying 7% interest on that every year, it's a significant amount of money every year. Mm -hmm. And we also didn't really get the OPEB uh, 101, so... The OPEB 101 will be exactly the same as the PERS 101 because it's the same concept. It's just a different number. But I'm more than happy to go through it. Which OPEB. is? OPEB. Eight million. Okay, so now we're up to 36 million. No, because it was, no, it's, it's, tw it's 28. It's 10 million for, tier one, for PERS miscellaneous, 10 million for PERS safety, and 8 million for OPEB. So it's 28 million overall. And that number will change come. Our, our next evaluation because it'll all go down a little bit because um, earnings were higher than expected. But, okay. But we can go through all that and come That's up okay. with, no, come no. Up with we it. That's okay. We know. don't need to go through it on, all now. Yeah. But if we, you know, I, I can bring that back in the fall or early winter when, you know, we're through the bay lens issues and, yeah. and, spend a, and have some time to really spend and dig into that because I would say that that could be a two or three hour kind of conversation as well. And I just don't think today, I did not think today was the day to spend a couple of hours on something as arcane as actuarial well, information. This is very interesting, though. I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, if we have anybody that's viewing it at home, that, you know, they're learning a lot from this. I, I think, you know, uh, I've never, you know, for all, all the years I've spent on the council, I've never really gone that in depth on PERS and stuff and how it works. So, no, I appreciate that. And thanks, Terry, for uh, prompting uh, Stuart to come up with the. Uh, PERS 101. I always, <laughs> uh, I, I always have my concerns about it, um, just like I have concerns about, you know, and and will we differ on this? I'll I'll call it a deficit budget, and and Stewart says no, we're not in deficit. We're we're within budget, but we're borrowing from reserves, and right. it, it's just a difference in in looking at it. But it always has my concerns when we're using reserves to make a balanced budget. Because we are balanced, as Stuart will remind me every time he gets when I say we don't have a balanced budget. Um, it's just that we're taking it out of reserves, yeah. and that's always a concern for me. I, I always like listening to both uh, Clay and Stuart's uh, 
uh, stories about Reno that when they had a million dollars in their reserves, they they were happy. <laughs> yeah, we were we were. They uh, had a lot larger budget there. I mean, uh, yes, I, I, and I and you know, and I and I do share, you know, as much as you know, you know, Councilmember O'Connell and I, Connell and I have the back and forth at this point in time. I I do have the same general I gen, same general thought is you know how how much money do you want to take out of your savings account? On an annual basis to pay for your ongoing costs, uh, you know your savings account is a one-time pot of money. Um, you know the you know what I look at is um, not only do I look at you know where are we, but what's the expectation that we're going that that all my numbers are going to work out. So right now we're looking, you know, and I'll say a million dollars coming out of projected coming out of general fund fund balance. I know we're slightly below, but it's minimally below. So let's say a million dollars coming out of general fund fund balance. Uh, we're talking about 18, you know, 17, 18 million dollars of revenue, 17, 18 million dollars of expenditures. It doesn't take very much to be off to make that up. And I can see the other side of it is if something drastically changed in the economy, not, you know, not that we're expecting it in 18, 19 or 19, 20 to say, yeah, you know, if we're off on the, if the economy goes south a little bit, we won't, may, may not get all of our revenues, and that might need to borrow. You may need to use more of our fund balance. And over the years, we've gone, I think, as low as seven million. And we council gave us permission to go down to five, and we built that, you know, that seven million back up to fourteen. And I think that's kind of, you know, the history that we we've, we've had with Clay and myself here to really focus on what can we do on a year by year basis to make sure that we are not using our one time money more than one time. And that I think is actually where the bigger question is, is do, you know, do we have a plan for dealing with it and do we have a plan going forward to be able to make our payments? And then the question comes, are there services and programs that the city council wants to see different? Which leads us right into the next aspect of the budget, which is where all the departments come in. And this year we're gonna do a little bit differently. Um, we're gonna really be focusing on the programs and the purpose of those programs. Because um, I think the bigger question in all of this is, are we really doing what the community wants us to do? Um, are there things that we're doing that the community would say, yeah, you know, that's really nice to have, but we don't really need it? And it, it yeah, so while the times are okay, let's continue to do it. But these are things that when times are tough, let's think, let's think twice about. Um, so, you know, the department, you know, this will be a different kinds of, this will be a different presentation than you've seen in the past. Um, I've seen all the department's presentations and they will all look a little bit different this year. Normally we try and be very similar but because we're doing, because um, we're really focusing on programs, uh, we've all the departments have taken a little bit of a different tact on it. And part of it that I'll be looking for is the city councils, which ones they really enjoyed, which ones they didn't quite think worked as well. And we'll be tailoring our future presentations more towards what you what you think is very useful. And as I said, one of the things that we're looking at is over the next year and a half to spend more time with each department, because today we can only really hit the highlights. But over the next year and a half, we'd like to spend a lot more time with the council and with each and have each department come in and really go through all of their programs and really talk to you about what are we trying to achieve with the programs and how do you know as a council when when we've achieved it and how do we you know and how do we as professionals can tell you when we've achieved what we're looking for? I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think are really important for gearing up for the next two-year cycle. So, with that, if there aren't any, okay, uh, council question, Karen. Okay. Um, I think the idea of a, a layman's version uh, with with the graphics included. I'm a, a very visual learner, and certainly looking at the the graphics you put together, it's very simple for people to see. You know, what's in, what's up, what's up, what's going on there, rather than these pages and pages of numbers that people just gloss over. <coughs> and they love doing what you do. <coughs> Can we think about that? I think that would be a really good sure. idea. Sure. This, this is this is this is the much more graphical than it's been in the past. I know. Harry's helped me with that over the years. <laughs> mostly with colors. But, yeah, that's well, mostly with colors. But but colors graphs. There. No, I didn't have <laughs> yeah, anything to do with the colors, but I'll let him know if there's ones I can't read. And I appreciate that because I, I actually did went into Excel and said, okay, you know, can, what can I use for people who are colorblind? Being very aware of that, and it's the Excel version we have does not have a colorblind version for graphs. Well, and I'm not quite colorblind. I know you're not, but color there, deficient. But there are other but, people who are. Yes. And that becomes a problem when you do everything in color. 
you know, it's one of the things I'm becoming more aware of is just all the times that we're not really communicating, you know, one of the issues that we have as our thing is public education and community engagement. And it's, you know, and the question is, is are we really engaged and are we really educating? And I can put as much information out as I want, but if people aren't understanding it, then I'm not really either educating or engaging. And there's a lot of different groups of people that I, you know, the more I think about it and the more that we're in society today, the more it becomes aware of like what people are able and not able to understand and to read and to, you know, and all that. I, I say, okay, so how can I do this better? So I, I do appreciate it and it's just, Time crunches, and I didn't have, you know, and I tried to find the easy fix. I did not find it on that one. Because I also thought that if I had put all the hash marks and everything, that would not have worked at all. Mm. Because the graphs were too dense for hash marks. Cliff, you have questions? No, I just, uh, it, was, it was great getting your, your you know, overall perspective on how you look at the budget, Stuart. I, I think it's just extremely helpful and um, yeah, looking forward to getting all the feedback from the department heads and then, and then having that discussion amongst the council um, and having you come on back um, at the end of the, of the workshop. And everybody behind you is still very much awake. Wow. Madison? I don't have any questions. Terry? No. No. I, I had one, Stuart. Mm. Um, just some curiosity about the unsecured property taxes. Yes. Is, is that distributed as the same ratio as pr secured property taxes? No, actually, unsecured property tax, I think I think if it's during the middle of the year, you come in with a new piece of unsecured property, it is. But it's the same way, yes. It's, you know, it's based on what <coughs> you have there. Um, so if you have... A piece of a uh, piece of machinery that's not Say secured. A boat. Let's use a boat because I pay unsecured property taxes. <laughs> yes. So we so your boat is part of the unsecured property for the successor agency, and we get whatever percentage that we're supposed to get in the tax rate area that you are in. And I don't know your the exact because every tax there's like twenty different tax rate areas I think in the city of Brisbane, mm -hmm. and each one has slightly different percentages. Based on what we were, what we had collected back in 1978. Oh. When Prop 13 went in and they said, okay, here's the percentage you were of overall property taxes within that tax rate area with all your other overlapping. And see, to me, I think the easy way to then do it is all your secured property goes into the tax rate area or your unsecured and you get that percentage. But they say, no, you get a percentage based on your overall city versus the overall county. Mm. As I said, again, I don't understand how they do their thing. <laughs> it works and our numbers go up and and it would probably be close whichever way you do it. Oh, okay. But yes, we do get it based, we do get money off of your boat okay. and about 20%. Okay. Yeah, so it's close. To it's close to 20%. Close. Okay. All right, very good. Um, so thank you very much, thank you. Stuart. Yeah. So we're going to start the department heads, but let's take a, a five-minute break and uh, before we start. Okay. Sure. All right. Are we having lunch at 12 still? Huh?
Whatever you want. It's still hurt. <laughs> Eat that brownie, you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so we're going to start with fire. Ron, uh, you get to do the maiden voyage here on this. I, uh, Mayor and Council members, are we on? I hope you have those uh, merger numbers for us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Or not. Uh, no, I'm teasing. No. Of course I'm teasing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah or, either, or not. Right? Oh, my I goodness. Think just some confusion. <laughs> hmm. That's polite. Okay. We'll call it confusion. Yeah, right? Yeah, sure. I heard there was some confusion. Yeah, I. We'll, 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 we'll meet and see us. Find him down. Hello? Test, test. I'm, I'm not on. Hello? I'm not on either. I'm not on either. Oh. Oh yeah, we lost she our muted city us. clerk. <laughs> so these are not in order hey, of uh, here. First up for department overheads is fire department. So, Mayor, Council yeah. members, um, I'll go ahead and go through uh, fire department uh, <coughs> presentation and uh, certainly ask questions as we go along. Uh, the mission statement, it's really just about being prepared and then taking care of people. I wanted to include the large organization chart so that you get the essence of what North County Fire is about and how we pool all those resources in order to deal with all three of the cities. Um, and you, we may come back to this if, if you have other questions, but that's generally how North County Fire is organized. Um, it really does provide for surge of issues or surge of uh, projects or emergencies. We can move that around between all three of the cities, and so you pay for uh, an amount of money that's a fraction of, of the cost of what all that is there, but you get all of that when you need it. Um, this is kind of a, a, a micro view of, uh, of the fire department, the one engine company that's here in Brisbane, um, and the nine firefighters that uh, uh, staff that, uh, that fire engine, and uh, that may come back to a little bit of a discussion about uh, as I get into the operations section of this. Uh, no new budget items. So as it relates to fire and life safety mm -hmm. compliance, uh, the question of we put a lot of effort into doing uh, inspections and primarily we're focused on uh, multifamily because of the large life uh, presence is there. But we do every business, every occupancy, um, there are requirements in the law to do multifamilies. State law requires multifamilies, um, schools, and then there are permitted occupancies that, that need to be inspected. So we do that by way of fire companies and then dedicated fire inspectors. And uh, the dedicated fire inspectors focus in on the more complicated, more in-depth uh, level of the fire code. Uh, we think, although we don't have empirical data that would show us this, we have very low occurrence of fire and we'd like to think it's because we are actually into the buildings we're actually out there uh, interacting with businesses and and uh, the apartment complexes and that and so um, by doing so we uh, we have to believe after all these years of doing it um, that it does have an impact on we are one of the only fire agencies um, that I know of around that does every single occupancy one time a year and if you've seen some articles in the paper uh, recently about fire inspections, um, fires that have occurred in buildings and that we have always 
fortunately, and it's not without a lot of work and a lot of um, effort, we, we go out and inspect each and every building um, annually. So um, we sit very well. The uh, grand jury this year uh, took a look at fire inspections based upon the incident that occurred in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we uh, we are right up there. We're probably the leaders when it comes to getting fire inspections done. The importance of of the whole process of reviewing uh, new developments, tenant improvements, remodels, and that is that we're allowed to get in and do the pre-fire engineering before it happens. Try and create a safe building before uh, we end up with uh, that being uh, implemented, and then coming back and trying to reinstall fire protection systems and that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of effort is put into as something new is coming on, uh, interacting the ordinances that might be there. Somebody does more than 50% of a tenant improvement, then we retrofit for sprinklers. If it's a brand new construction, then we make sure that all the fire protection features are in place for that. Get to emergency response. Um, we always, you'll hear me talk about speed and weight of the response. That's trying to match up how quickly we can get there with how many people we need to mitigate whatever that emergency may be, whether it's a medical emergency, a fire, a hazardous materials incident, you name it, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're responding to uh, emergency and non-emergency incidents. Um, but it's always about how quickly you can get there and, and with the right number of people to mitigate um, an incident. Rolling into the um, effective response force, that's kind of a, that's, that's based upon a national standard that talks about if you have a residential structure fire, which generally is what we respond to. We do have commercial fires, but a vast majority of our fires are residential. That you have a minimum of 16 people that respond to that, that structure fire. So when I got talking about the engine company here, you have one engine company. What we do is we bring all the other outside resources and those part of North County Fire to accomplish getting, besides the three that arrive, we get the additional people to make up, including a, a chief officer to and other chief officers to supervise. There's a whole bunch of tasks to get done when you, when you respond to any emergency, and it takes the right number of those people to do those to try and mitigate an EMS call or a fire call and keep it from expanding and or growing you're trying to knock that, that incident down before it gets big. Um, and that kind of rolls back to the inspection piece that we don't want fires. Um, if we do get fires, we want those protection systems to, to hold those fires so they don't get very big and we can come in and take care of it. If you didn't do inspections, you didn't have um, any kind of pre-fire engineering going on, your building could have a fire and then you're, mo you're going to the other buildings and so on and so forth. So that's the importance of, of what we do from, from that standpoint. I think that is that the end. It must be. <laughs> must be. <laughs> so I, that was I didn't fast. know if I rolled into the next persons or not. So so with that, I'd be happy to answer uh, uh, any questions. Of course, this is a little different approach, as the finance director said, than, than we normally have done. So tried to give you the context of just a couple of the programs that that we're doing, and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Okay, council questions. Where were you, Cliff? Okay, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Chief Myers, for thanks for coming uh, down today and, and giving us that that brief uh, overview. So, um, you know, just going to pages one thirty nine and one forty. Yeah, Stuart had uh, shown us the little bubble um, like outbreaks of mm -hmm. tr trying to describe um, what's in these budgets or you know what's in, what's in each. Uh, um, area you know trying to you know are, are we achieving our goals things like that mm -hmm. you know you, you deal with three cities mm -hmm. right so three different budgets you know how is this one different in uh what are the if there are any strengths in the way that we're doing this to make sure that we're spending the money uh wisely and achieving our goals well i i think that all three have the same, you know, idea of, of trying to be efficient with the dollars, the, the elected officials and that. I, I don't see a difference between the three there. Um, they generally all try and look at are we ineffective in the programs or the policies or, or the things that we're doing. So I don't really see a big difference as it relates to that. I just think it might be a different approach and what's comfortable for, for each of those elected officials as it relates to um, how they determine the level of funding um, that they want to 
provide for fire services within okay. that community. So w when you look at these little pop-outs here, does it make you think, uh, you know, a little bit like more in depth and, and you know, as, as opposed to if they weren't there? Um, no, huh? <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, okay. We generally come to you with, st with stats because we're, we're more of an organization that, that kind of operates off of goals and statistics. So generally we'd come in here and show you how quickly we responded, how many inspections, how many, all those kinds of various things that we do to in order to keep our people prepared and or to respond and how that looks. Uh, I think these might be something that would allow you to maybe ask a question about what it is that you would have a question about a particular program. Is it meeting the needs of the community um, type of a thing? Yeah. Um, I, I, I believe it does. Um, we always look at having more is better, but um, that's a determination based upon the amount of resources. What you sure, yeah, you have to have that do. balance. So that gets to my next question. So, um, so we have these three cities, Brisbane, Pacifica, and Daly City. Um, you know, I don't go to the Daly City council meetings, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I am in contact with folks who are on the council, uh, people who work with the, um, with the administration. Mm -hmm. And so there are concerns about Daly City, um, Daly City's financial well-being mm -hmm. into the future. And so, um, uh, you know, Daly City is the biggest partner in this, uh, in this JPA. And so, um, if there are financial problems with the city in the in the near future, that could have potentially uh, impacts on us. So, um, can you just well, I, a, I, and the, the challenges that. that were described by the finance director um, are the same challenges in all three of the cities in terms of uh, funding um, into the future. And the vast majority of what we spend our money on is our employees in order to provide the service. Uh, as it relates to, to North County Fire and the three cities, you know, the nice thing about North County Fire was that each of those um, determined the level of, of services they want to provide within their city. We then take that and, and make it in such a way that we can help each other. Um, and it's not just us. It's not just North County. We get help from South City. We get help from, we go from here all the way down to Menlo Park when they get big fires. So it's kind of a countywide approach of delivering fire services um, in this county. We're almost like a county fire department the way we function for response purposes. Um, so that that's a good thing. But um, I don't, last year, uh, last year, God, time flies. Um, I believe it was last year we eliminated um, a, an engine company yes. in Daly City. So um, that uh, didn't make a void in the system as far as a district. There's still a fire company there responding out of it. We just have one less fire company. Um, and we haven't um, seen that as a trend. I don't see that this year there was no reductions to the fire budget within uh, Daly City as far as services are, are concerned. Pacifica, the same thing. So I, th I think that was a modification in order to get through some difficult financial times. I don't see it as clearing up completely going mm -hmm. forward, uh, but we'll see. Okay. All right. So in the next uh, couple of years, we probably looking good. Yeah, yeah. I don't see. I don't see a degradation. Whatever occurs in the others, I don't see a degradation necessarily in any fire service that that, um, that would impact our, our residents. City of Brisbane. Okay, great. Thank you. Good question, Cliff. Uh, is Karen? Uh, I have none right now. Okay, Madison. What's a sinking fund? So, um, just to give the history on it, years and years ago, um, we would come to the city council and say, "Wow, we have to buy brand new." Uh, personal equipment, and it was generally a large number, and nobody would be prepared for it. So we asked probably 16, 17 years ago, let's start putting money away based on all those items that we need to buy. So when the useful life of that item comes up, we just have the money there, we bring it as part of the budget, and we tap into that so that we've planned for it. Yeah. All at once. That's what I thought it was, but I just wanted to make sure, kind of like how we do our vehicle replacement. Yes, exact sort of same fun. thing. Only okay. it's a little, it's a subgroup within the fire department for a whole list of things that right. we can put money away for and plan for it. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's been a <clears throat> very evolutionary process, you know, through the budget, you know, through the years, and I think we're we're doing pretty well now. As mm -hmm. I think it's Stuart's overview of putting money aside, yes, and different yeah. sinking funds, and yep. kind of doing that with the marina too, mm -hmm. Harry. Uh, 
Um, so the on the the actual budget fund, mm -hmm. uh, the proposed eighteen nineteen versus the approved budget of seventeen eighteen, it looks as if one of the large areas of difference is in benefits and the other is in supplies and services. Uh -huh. Is the supplies and services, as I'm not really seeing where it's broken down here mm -hmm. um, I can easily. Probably, oh, yeah. Um, is that including the new fire engine or? No, under uh, North County Fire Authority is probably the largest item in there. Uh, that's the 396 paid in there. From the 1718 to this point, there was increases that occurred, one sharing the cost of a new position and then just kind of the, the uh, cost that you approved the other day as part of the North County Fire Authority. Okay, so that's that was that's, an unanticipated addition to a... a it was planned for, staff. yeah. It, yeah, planned for. But it, it, well, okay. And then the capital or the... Uh, Benefits that's just due to what our so the and so the benefits um, probably the finance directorate but I'm assuming that's just that PERS and health care and those kinds of items increasing yes yeah and of capital expenditures that we didn't have in sixteen seventeen but then right. approved basically twenty thousand. In so um, and I may need some in help uh, as it relates to that, and I'm not. Sh I believe that could be the replacement fund. Is it broke out as a replacement fund that goes in there, Stuart? No, oh, that's probably what it is. Um, I don't want to look. I yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, and then I'm, the I'm glad we've got it in there. I just um, wanted to make sure. It's, it's been in there every year. That's why I kind of. Uh, um, when I saw that there wasn't one in 1617, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why, but it's been there every year for a lot, um, lots of years. Yeah, because it's an actual expenditure, so it doesn't get spent. It goes into the sinking fund. So it drops down into fund balance. In 1718, it's still approved for it. And then in 1819, it's for the $40,000 for the equipment that Ron talked about. So 20500 would be the sinking fund, and then the other remainder would come out of the sinking fund that we just that we've set aside from the previous years. Right. Well, and, and just to add that, this is a year where we are buying uh, protective clothing. So there's a, there's a, uh, that's part of that 40000 I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it jumped up. So you have the 20000 is going in, but then we're pulling money out to buy all new protective uh, all across North County. We buy it all together at one time. Mm -hmm. So get a break in price out. Maybe. Yeah, we get it. That's, that, and that's one of the, been one of the benefits for all these years is the, the economy of scale and the, you know, the fact that we have been able to reduce cost and we can make large purchases together and, and get a better better price on things. So that's some of the indirect savings and, and benefit of, of the North County Fire Authority. And then it goes the same for grants. We're able to get grants. When we get grants, we get grants for, you know, all three, more of a regional kind of an approach as opposed to just one singular. Yeah, and also notice for, for Brisbane, when one of the engines goes into some heavy maintenance, that we borrow a, an engine from Daly City. Yeah, and in, that, in that fact, really nice. the reserve engine, we made a decision uh, to, and we call it 181, not spend any more money on it because it's not worth yeah. it. So we've taken a an, another reserve engine, um, and we use them between all three. We've moved, uh, and you'll see a Daly City on it, but it's permanently here f to be available until we get yeah. the new replacement engine and, but we didn't see any need to be spending huge amounts of money on a reserve engine that just wasn't worth it to do right. that and we'll take the frontline engine and put it in reserve so we'll have a good reserve and then we'll also have a new engine it takes a year for that engine to get so even though we're we're going out to purchase it it'll be a year before it shows up it takes that long to to build it and bring it in so in the the year to come, we'll have that other engine reserved there to utilize when the frontline engine goes in for its yeah. normal maintenance or any repairs. Is it spec'd out? <clears throat> it is. We, we, that's the other thing. We, we buy the same type of you know, apparatus for all three cities. So we have a, a, a spec that we use so we don't, we don't go adding more cost into one just because somebody thinks it looks, uh, you know, it'd be a neat thing to do. We, we, we was, that's the same thing with our protective gear. We get what we need and what is functional. We just don't try and be different just to be different in all three. That's, we buy the same thing for all three, most everything we do. 
So. Well, the same, having the same engine and having uh, mm. less training on different engine types, I'm sure is helpful. Yeah, when, true. When um, personnel go to use the equipment and they're called to another fire, they're familiar with that equipment. <clears throat> yeah, you know, and, and really nowadays it's so automated. Um, one of the biggest problems with new fire apparatus, we'd actually prefer to have the 30-year because it was just va pulling uh, valves and moving gears. Now it's all computer boards, and when those go bad, that's what the problem ends up being. We end up having fire apparatus out of service because it's not really the mechanical. We call it mechanical, but it's a it's some uh, electronic piece of it. Right, so there's no... There's no backup, there's, right? There's no... Not really. No, it's no. not like, you know... We Digitally, to, it doesn't work. You, you can't go to manual. No. Not, no. It's it's supposed to be better. Uh, we, we actually don't prefer it, but that's what it is now. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Any more questions, Terry? No. Thank oh. you. I, I had one, Ron. I, I wanted to um, know about our, our new uh, attack unit mm -hmm. that we have. Uh, how's that a how's that working out and do we use that for more medical responses it actually was primarily designed for and one of the first photos you saw was the fire that occurred some years ago 2008 um, that's primarily what that's going to be it's going to allow us to get off road get up while a fire small and be able to to um, stop a fire uh, mm -hmm. that's not, it's had a secondary effect and that is that when we've had hikers or people that have gotten off trail, we've had the ability to get that up in that same area and potentially move a patient from one place to the next. Mm -hmm. So we have it there. We, we uh, pretty much you'll see where it may be trailing the engine, so that especially summertime, wintertime we won't. Summertime it'll trail. So if we get a, f a wildland fire, vegetation fire, we will have it with them in case they're going to training or they're going wherever it is they need to go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's <coughs> primarily so we can deal with wildland vegetation fires. But it does have the ability to get off road and move a patient if we need to on that. Okay, does it respond? Because I haven't really seen, uh, really haven't had much, and I guess it's probably uh, uh, knock on wood yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> going on recently. Uh, you know, even medical issues that I haven't really heard a whole. So lot it of. isn't it isn't a, a medical response unit. Oh, okay. it, it 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 got utilized on an incident over here because somebody was off. Uh, in an area that it could get into and is more beneficial than trying to hand carry mm -hmm. somebody out type of a thing yeah. So it won't respond to medicals as a matter of, of a response It's primarily a wildland fire suppression unit that okay. gets into areas that um, the the fire engines can't get in uh, yeah. this can pump and roll which means it can be we can be walking with it or running with it and putting out fire engines have to come to a complete stop and then we extend hose lines mm -hmm to go um, fight wildland fires. So yeah. um, that's the benefit of this of this unit. Yeah, nice unit. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah. it's beautiful, you know, just. Yeah, so it so we're, we're it, it's here for, um, you know, that, that particular, that fire that happened in 2008, we had no ability to get off road. The only ones that we have that can get off road would be um, CAL FIRE type of engines that come right. in and, and do that. But the response is a long ways. Mm -hmm. Um, getting now aircraft helps and all other kinds of things that go into play but this would allow us to actually get right up in there when it was about a half acre fire yeah. and hadn't caught the wind and we'll take the crews and throw them onto that vehicle it can it can carry um, is it can it carry six or is it four Four or five. So what we'll do is we'll take two engines. We'll take the 81 engine, the 93 engine. They'll jump in. It has hand tools. It has all kinds of other things that we can do to try and minimize the spread of that fire pretty quickly and not have it come down and have to utilize our fire break or right. expose our community here in Brisbane to, to fire. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, thank you very right. much, Ron. Thanks. Have a safe trip. Thanks. Home. <laughs> thank you. I'll be uh, heading up there tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that brings us to community development department. John. I think we have the pizza got delivered. Hmm? I think the pizza got delivered. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, council's pleasure. What was council? Long is, um, huh? How long is this? Uh, short. Very short. Well, then let's okay. I said John's up here. Let's just do it. Okay. 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 So, so All right. Since you're um, up there. Good morning. I'll keep this brief. Afternoon now. Uh, <laughs> well, technically. <laughs> Point well taken. Okay. Yes, John. Let's see if I in, in my time, it's still morning, though. <laughs> <laughs>
Same. Okay. <laughs> um, again, uh, good afternoon, Council Members, Mayor. I'll do a real quick summary. Again, this is a little different budget f presentation format. So again, if you have questions or something that goes beyond um, what I do, feel free to jump in. Um, I think you're all pretty familiar with the organization. We handle both the planning and building side. Um, building side primarily through the administration of contract with uh, CSG, our outside consultant. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, in the structure that, that you're looking at in terms of commission and council support, uh, the one item that's of particular interest to us this year at a staff level is with the number of new um, planning commissioners we have, sort of developing some capacity building with them and their confidence in dealing with some of the planning issues that they may be seeing in the next couple of years. So we are spending a lot of effort and time both with in-house training with the city attorney and staff as well as trying to get them to as many outside um, you know, League of Cities training, other local professional opportunities they arise. And they're very receptive to that as well. So we've had a lot of good experience with that. Good. And again, tying it back to some of the council objectives, we really think it does promote um, you know, the idea of community building, ecological sustainability, and economic development all um, in their wheelhouse or issues that they will see over the next couple of years. Um, so I just want to highlight that. The other kind of thing I want to point out was some of the activities and trends and, you know, that we may see over the next uh, budget cycle of two years. Clearly, you know, it's no surprise to anybody in this room about the level of um, building permit activity, you know, that's occurred in the high level. This just illustrates, you know, of the valuation of, of building permits issued in the last several fiscal years. Um, you know, just 17, 18, we're not even through yet and we're up to 70 million in valuation compared to, you know, again, it's a fourfold, nearly a fourfold increase over historic rates here. So I want to point that out. Again, some of the big projects you've probably heard of or seen is HCP, the biotech down in Sierra Point. Sangamo is another um, tenant improvement for a company in, in taking uh, the, the old uh, Dakin building in mm -hmm. Sierra Point as well, and the Amazon uh, Fresh uh, on Valley Drive. So there some of the, the bigger value uh, TIs or, or building permits that were issued over the uh, last uh, fiscal year. And uh, you know, we'll, we may, I, I expect we'll see a trend of additional heavy act building activity for, for the short term. Uh, again, then some of the other sort of preview of things that we're aware of or we're going to keep an eye out in the future in terms of planning applications on private development, um, the Sierra Point Parcel 3, which is the former Opus office, there's looking at a, a conversion of that to a, a biotech R&D campus site. So that would be something that the Planning Commission will be reviewing in the near future. The Baylands, I don't think we need to talk about that this afternoon. Talk about that plenty of other times. And then the quarry, you know, we've had a number of, um, a lot of inquiries about people who want to buy the quarry for future development. Um, these tend to come and go, but um, certainly it's, it's under active discussion currently. And, you know, this may be something that comes to fruition over the next budget cycle as well. And then housing in terms of as a, as it translates to the activity we see, we're seeing an uptick on accessory dwelling unit construction. I don't have the statistics in front of me, a lot more interest in that. I don't know if it's really shown yet in terms of permits issued, but there are a number of property owners who are interested in taking advantage of those code provisions. And um, this is something that you'll see, and it's coming up just more immediately as um, infill in the R3 zone. We have people with a single family residence, and you know, they're looking at tearing down their single family residence, going in with, uh, you know, a triplex or four units. Planning Commission has actually has a couple of those kind of items in their upcoming agenda. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as property values are what they are, we may be seeing more of that in the, the near term than, than we've historically seen. Uh, lastly, city initiated programs. Um, I don't really have anything in particular. We're on a constant basis uh, trying to keep ahead with state law, keep up with state law, especially with what they change with housing law. It often has implications on our zoning ordinance requirements, and we're looking at actually amending our zoning ordinance to bring it into compliance with the last round of uh, housing bills that were approved last year. And again, part of what we do is try to actively monitor what is going on at state uh, legislation to try to 
keep up with that and advise the council if there are other changes to our local ordinances that are required. Um, then it's a new probably, game in California, housing roulette, right? Ex <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, uh, like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like the blindfold is on half the time. You never know how they're going to turn out. Um, then sort of larger city-initiated programs, you know, again, at the probably won't be this budget cycle, but certainly there will be a gear up for another yet another housing element, which is always a favorite activity. That will be something that shows up in the next two-year budget, certainly, in terms of the resources that are spent and required to do that. Uh, with that, and Stuart had mentioned this, this is really our only for fairly minimal budgetary requirement is we um, were holding our old building permit records on a antiquated technology, basically obsolete technology of microfiche. So we did go ahead and um, upgrade that into an electronic stor storage format so it's a lot more accessible to the public. And we're trying to make sure that stays current because we are going with electronic permitting as currently. So we're trying to have an integrated database so people don't have to search multiple databases for building permit activity and and that's being cloud hosted at the moment and we foresee that into the near future uh with that i'd entertain any questions you had have terry let's we'll start with you sorry uh when we've heard about the budget in the past, the community development, a lot of it has been, um, is that including, we're, we're talking planning department. Mm -hmm. um, is this the net amount or is some of this cost offset by plan fees? The cost is offset by plan fees. This is the net, this is the gross amount of expenditure that we anticipate. I'm sorry, what? It's the gross amount. Okay. So it, we we anticipate about, you know, we budget for around a hundred thousand, hundred fifteen thousand every year in revenues. Mm -hmm. um, as you as you can only imagine, this year we're doing much better in revenues. But you know, we also anticipate next year's expenditures are going to go up because a number of the building permits are going to be more than finished this year. So we will have collected money one year, and then we will spend money the next year. So this is one of the programs that's offset by revenue. Yes. And do we have just a basic offset number since it doesn't show in this document as such? Um, I, you can say no. No, we do. I just have to flip to the right page. That's all. On page... 40, um, and page 39, so 39 we anticipate about 150,000 building permit mm -hmm. revenue, and we anticipate, I'm looking for plan check, and about 115,000 in plan checks, and those are about what we anticipate every year, um, but as, as, you, as you imagine, mm. this building goes up we would we'll get more money in and at mid-year we would let you know that okay it just um would be nice to have that okay for future budgets you know not i'm not saying this time around right. but anticipated offsets because then we can when you're looking at priority budgeting you can say well we're budgeting 1.2 million we're getting 3 million back so the remaining services are where we have options for what's priority so okay it, it just would be nice to have maybe a separate box on the final page of the overview that that reflected just like in park and rec where we're going to have anticipation of money coming back in from fees so it's not that we're just expending all of this for one particular department and it would make it easier for me to have it there on the box the revenue source right okay so well not even the revenue source is just anticipated the fees the that time. are going to offset that amount right. it well, just would make yeah. it easier for me i'll include that next time great thank you madison i don't have any questions karen i don't have any questions clifford yeah. i just have just a couple here john thank you um you know and then also um i just want to you know say that uh you know, I think the support that you've been giving the council, you know, as we 
<laughs> go through this payments process has been great. You know, providing the, you know, the, the you know, the, the map with the little foam blocks, and you know, whenever we need support, you know, to get data, um, you know, you, you and your department have just gotten it to us, you know, right away. So, you know, thank you uh, for that. Um, you know, I, I'm glad to hear that the new planning commissioners are eager to to learn. I mean, we have some, you know, really, you know, smart. Uh, engaging people and um, you know they bring with them some excellent skills so acquiring those planning commission commissioner skills um, seems like you know they'll absorb it uh, really well and, and so the League of California Cities um, there is it an annual event or is it biannual it's annual it's annual okay and, and how many uh, uh, I had two commissioners um, who were able to make it this year the problem was the uh, appointments by the time the appointments came along, the conference was two weeks out, oh, uh, both sure. for registration and for scheduling. It was difficult for the new commissioners. So okay. I expect we'll we'll get um, hopefully, if not all three next year of who haven't been, at least two of those three to next year's conference. I'd like to get all three there. You've been uh, doing some in-house training too, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Correct. All right, and then then the web hosting um, is uh, so people. From the comfort of their own home, they could go to the city's website. They don't. They don't have to do it here. It's uh, well, right now. It is. Um, we're still trying to work the bugs out. Right now, it's on a. It's here still, um, but it's on a screen based. Um, um, so someone can basically get it loaded on the screen, and then they can get what they need. Uh, there are issues with proprietary information when it comes to building permit records mm. about viewing and what you can view versus what you can copy. And we're trying to work out some of those sort of technical issues before we can roll it out to somebody can just sort of search the search those uh, online and at their own. Because, you know, we do have to have be able to control what can be printed, which is a yeah. challenge. Yeah, you know, you know, also, you know, people just pull out their smartphone and, okay, I'm going to take a exactly. picture of this. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I know there are certain, I mean, that's the problem with some of these intersection of law proprietary law and technology that don't fit well together anymore okay and then um, I guess these are two questions for Stuart in regards to this so you know the construction activity has uh, increased considerably uh, from the last couple of years and you know 70 million dollars compared to 10 and 15 16. or 12 or whatever yeah so um, it, and I know we touched briefly upon that earlier Stuart um, but these are things that that you don't um, put in your your five year budget, or you wait until they're more secure before you actually put them into uh, anticipated uh, uh, revenue. I wait until they're on the ground and built. Wait until they're on the ground, okay. Because you never quite know how the assessor is going to assess it, no matter what the building permits say. Okay. All right. And then you know, I, I know we don't want to talk about the balance, but you know, we've been doing all this ramping up, and we're, we're putting a lot of energy into it. You know, wh where are we with UPC, you know, covering some of these costs that uh, that, that we're putting out in, in regards to analyzing their project? Um, I mean, we, they are, they ha they're, they're making their payments as we anticipate them making their payments. So, I mean, those things that we can bill for, we do. Those things that are more related to city costs, um, we pay for out of you know out of the general fund. Sure. Um, that have our costs increased considerably over the last year compared to previous years. Uh, or is it no, I mean consistent. It's probably been a little bit less from what we've because I mean if you think about doing this doing the document itself. The EIR. Yeah, the IR was okay. two yeah, our million. Our consultant costs have gone down a little bit because of where we are in the work. But whether the city has sort of independent costs, I defer to Stuart. Right now, I mean, I mean, the, the the amount of you know the putting together the draft EIR and the final EIR was much more time intensive from a consultant perspective. That's true. Now we're working off that document right. rather than building it. Mm -hmm. And and I would assume that a lot of the costs in this process are more with our legal and supportive costs for the council than it is for 
the community development okay. department. Mm -hmm. So that might be addressed when we get to the legal budget um, instead of being necessarily in community development budget. Yeah. All right, thank you, John. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Thank you. Hold on, John. <laughs> Sorry. I got a question. <laughs> Pizza waiting. <laughs> he knows how you remind things, uh, Clark. <laughs> Amazon Fresh, that's a food delivery service? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's more their distribution. It's a distribution. Type distribution facility. center. Yeah. So um, they are taking over the old Monster Cable building. Is that right? Is that yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, how many employees uh, are, are projected? Well, I'd have to get back to you on that, and I'm not. I'm not sure how many okay. yeah, on site yeah. versus. Uh, I think more of a distribution than a real on site yeah. office population is my recollection. Yeah, because I, I know Monster that. had like at one point in time like 500 employees there. Yeah, it's more uh, space intensive, warehouse intensive than office oh, okay. intensive. Right. I know they're hiring like crazy. That's all I can tell you. Hmm? They're hiring like crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, somebody had asked me about that. No, I'll, get, I'll find that out and get back to Okay. You. All right. Very good. So uh, thank, you, thank you very much, John, for all that you do. And I, I know it's been a busy time. So, yeah. Uh, council's pleasure. Um, do you want to make this a working lunch or do you want to take 30 minutes? Or what's, what's the play? I would rather, rather not eat on camera. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and just turn your microphone off. No. Okay, all right, all right. That's, that's fine, huh? How about just 15 or 20 minutes? We'll yeah, all okay. Time. All right, so we'll take uh, 30 minutes in, and uh, food's here, so help yourself. Okay.